two of the uh, Reclaiming the American Project Conference. Uh, for those of you who were able to be with us yesterday, I think you uh, were able to participate in uh, two very interesting panels on uh, where we are as a country from a, a cultural and even psychological standpoint. Uh, the second panel, um, we looked at how we define this conservatism of connection, which is uh, the, the title for this conference. And so you know, uh, especially for those of you who uh, this is your first day here, the outline of this conference follows a document that we created in a small group of um, academics and activists who we brought here to campus last year to look at the future of the conservative movement. In your orange folders, there should be a print of that, a way forward document, a four page framing um, essay on uh, essentially the themes that came out of deliberations here on campus. And so you know the outline and structure for uh, the conference, starting yesterday, running through today, and into tomorrow morning, is essentially structured around that document. So in that first paragraph, when we're looking at uh, where we are as a country, this uh, issue of loneliness and alienation, that's where we not only start the document, but that's where we started the conference yesterday. As we moved into the second and third paragraphs and started to look at how we define this conservatism of connection, that's where we went in the document and that's where we've gone in the conference. And um, so as we get into today's panels, we're really now moving ahead towards looking at the specific institutions that we believe need to be reclaimed in order to provide these institutional points of connection for an increasingly alienated country. And so we'll begin first with religious liberty. We will go on to higher education. We will look at uh, foreign policy and how we understand that. We will look at uh, e pluribus unum and how we understand the diversity and finding unum within our pluribus. And, uh, and so we will begin through those panels exploring each one of those issues in depth and obviously through uh, a number of different lenses. When we get into tomorrow, we'll begin with a discussion around millennials and the possibility of a new coalition being formed around this conservatism of connection. And then we will conclude uh, late tomorrow morning with a discussion around uh, a possible policy outline for uh, supporting this conservatism of connection. So um, in between that, uh, I know some of the feedback that we got from yesterday was that it felt like people were drinking from a fire hose. There's a lot of content here. And, uh, and so I hope everybody feels free to take breaks when they need to. Uh, we are offering breaks obviously throughout the agenda as we look ahead uh, to uh, the rest of the day. And, um, and uh, the finish line for today ends at the Malibu Pier with a reception down at Casa Escobar. So I'm hoping you can all join us for a great time of, of uh, fellowship and, uh, and, and talking with panelists and others who are here today. So we begin this morning with our first panel titled The Wisdom of Solomon, Finding the Balance in America's Religious Liberty. And so without further ado, I will turn it over to the co-director of the American Project, my friend Rich Taffel, uh, to begin this morning's program. Rich. Good morning, everybody. This topic, we figured we'd choose early in the morning because it's so easy. There's no disagreement. There's no conflict. It's straightforward. Something just to get us started. Religious liberty is definitely one of the most contentious and complicated topics that we could be dealing with. You'll notice that in this conference, as the dean said yesterday, we're trying to marry up not just an academic event, we have activists and academics, and we're trying to mix people who are doing it on the ground and people who are doing it with the great ideas, and we have a great mix of panelists to accomplish that. I wanted to set a little bit of the context with my background from an activist perspective, and I think this context 
context could help us understand why today in 2018 this issue is as contentious as it is and seems to be getting more contentious, not less, and how we're going to sort that out. What is the balance? We know that we have this protection for religious freedom, but where are the boundaries? So by way of background, I am a minister and pastor. I went to Harvard Divinity School. I am not an expert in the legal issues. If you want to talk to me about Christian mysticism, I can talk for hours as a nerd, but most of you don't want to talk about that. Nobody wants to talk to me about that. But I also got very involved with politics, and it was based on my faith. Years ago, I worked for, I was an openly gay supporter for Bill Weld running for office in Massachusetts for governor. He won by a very slim margin. There was only five Republicans in the state of Massachusetts. So at 30 years old, he appointed me adolescent health director with no qualifications. And there I was working for a Republican governor, and it was historic because the gay issue was so controversial at that time, particularly in the Republican Party. I start getting calls from a member of the Bush Quail campaign, Bush Quail. That was before, right? There was even another Bush before that for many who don't realize. And it was a gay staffer who felt he was being pushed out. The long story short is that he was fired from the campaign and sued on sexual orientation discrimination and said, I'm kind of at the end of my rope. I'm at the end of my wits. Can you come to Washington and just stand with me as the media onslaught is coming on? So I thought, oh, crap, I'm going to lose my job in the Weld administration. But I came down to D.C., and the next thing we knew, we were on national television. We were on Nightline the first night talking about it. And then the next night, a show that used to be around called Larry King Live, live television. And what was interesting in that discussion was that the Bush Quail campaign put forth as their representative for the reason they let this guy go, Reverend Jerry Falwell. And the logic that he used for it said, we are a Christian party, we are a conservative party, and there's no place for gays in this conservative party. And so it's based on our being a Christian party. I, being a minister, debated Jerry Falwell for a few minutes on national television where he said, I'm a Christian. I said, I'm a Christian. He said, I'm a Bible-believing Christian. I said, I believe in the Bible too. He said, do you take the Bible literally, Richard? And I said, you don't, Mr. Falwell. He shot that. I said, should slaves obey their masters, which was the passage in Scripture used to separate the churches during slavery. And he sort of rocked back and said, I don't support slavery. And that debate launched a political career for me in a way. But what was interesting, if you think about it, that's not too long ago that a political party was using the language of a religion to say, these folks are in, these folks are out. For the next decade, at Law Care Republicans, most of my debates immediately went to a religious debate. So it would be something on policy, but then it would go to religion. Now fast forward to about five years ago. Five years ago, I'm at a libertarian business leader conference, and their question is, how can we, what can we do to get rid of the evangelicals in the conservative movement? Because they are what is holding us back. And there was something called the Benedict Option, which many of you have heard about, the idea that evangelicals, conservative Christians, should pull themselves out of public life and to protect their faith against the secular culture. And they said, we should buy their bus tickets. Can anybody understand why we should be supporting evangelicals? I found myself in this situation arguing on behalf of evangelicals and saying, this is what religious liberty is. It means not people you agree with. It is defending people you disagree with based on faith. So for the coalition to exist, it has to be defending the evangelical. Then at an event where I actually met the dean, which was we were the two conservatives at a nonpartisan progressive gathering, and I was on a panel with Black Lives Matter, and we were talking about religious liberty. And it was clear that Hillary Clinton would become president. And I was talking about how we need to do civility, we need to talk, and they said, no, we're not coming to your table. You're coming to our table, and we're taking names. And we're going to remember who was with us and who was against us. And another person said, and the first thing we need to do is go after the church nonprofit status. We have to go after the churches. They are the labor unions of the conservative movement. And so here again, I'm in a completely different setting, making an argument for, no, this is what religious 
liberty means, folks. But they said, look what was done to us. Now the chance is a chance for revenge. And so those are t I, I share those stories as some of the tensions that are building up to this moment. And then most recently, a friend of mine who's a very strong evangelical was explaining his vote and his support for President Trump. And he said, don't agree with his lifestyle. Don't agree with a lot of his policies. He's a bully. We need a bully right now because they are bullies. And if we're going to survive, we need our bully. This is some of the tension that's in this moment. I also am on the national governing board of the National Council of Churches and recently did a visit with the president of Egypt. And in that meeting, he said, uh, listen, I am living in the Middle Ages. I have to subdue people whose uh, religious beliefs we disagree with. We don't have your religious liberty. If I unravel, the Middle East unravels. Tell your president to support me. We met with Christian leaders in Egypt who said, we love our president. If it weren't for him, a strong man, a bully, we could argue, we would be fleeing. We'd be refugees. This is what happens when you lose religious liberty. One of the most beautiful gems in America is the fact that we have a pluralist society that fights for all faiths. And I personally believe it is only represent, it's only true when you're fighting for the faith that has the least power in the room. It's not a defense of your own perspective, but it's a defense of those who don't. I come from a line of ministers and I'm inspired by my cousin, who was a German theologian who opposed Adolf Hitler. And his quote, which I, I, I love, is something along the lines, um, until you've wept with the Jews, you cannot sing Gregorian chants. And that was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he eventually was put into a death camp. And one of Hitler's last acts was to have him hung. But he, stu he stood with the Jews in Germany. My uh, context for this is this is a complicated issue. And we have people who are experts in this topic will help us see these various issues from cakes and the cake ruling to last week the Muslim ban was another controversial uh, issue that was debated by religious scholars on liberty. We're right in the middle of it. So I want to give that context of why some of the tension, the feelings of revenge, the power dynamics that are behind this topic of religious liberty. And so to begin, Stephanie Barclay is going to kick us off. She is one of the leading scholars in the United States on the topic of religious liberty, has had cases before the Supreme Court. I'm going to let each panelist um, talk a little bit about their background as it relates to this topic. But we are so lucky to have you and so grateful that you could be here with us. And could you give us some of the, maybe some of the background, particularly with your legal perspective? Absolutely. So it's such a privilege to be here and such a great event uh, and rich. I do want to talk to you about Christian mysticism. So All right. you, you've got at least somebody, one person. One person. Yeah. Uh, and thank you. Uh, I do. Uh, I am a scholar in First Amendment issues at BYU Law School, and I also, for the last several years, have been someone in the trenches, a litigator at a nonprofit law firm called the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, dealing with a lot of these cases that you've heard about um, before the Supreme Court. And at Beckett, we like to say that we defend religious liberty from A to Z, from Anglicans to Zoroastrians. And I can't tell you how happy we were when we got that Zoroastrian case, because before it was A to M, and it just didn't have the same ring to it. But uh, we take really seriously the idea that religious liberty is about defending freedoms for groups with whom you may not understand or whom you may deeply disagree. I want to touch on really quickly the masterpiece cake shop decision, just two principles from that decision that I think are broadly applicable and relevant to many of the other cases and discussions that are going on right now in the religious liberty context. In masterpiece, one of the principles that was animating Justice Kennedy's decision there was the idea that we need to uh, apply our laws in an even-handed way and to provide protection on an even-handed basis to groups. Jack. Uh, Phillips, the baker in that case, was not the first baker who declined to bake a cake for an event with which he disagreed, but he was the first baker in Colorado to be punished for doing that. In Colorado, there were also a number of other bakers who had been asked to bake cakes that would be condemning uh, homosexuality, and the, cakers, the baker said, no, that's offensive. We don't want to participate in that or bake that cake. And Colorado said, that's fine. You shouldn't have to bake a good for an event or a message that you disagree with. But when Jack Phillips wanted to decline in a similar way, then he, he faced government penalty for doing that. And the Supreme Court 
have said that's a double standard and double standards are dangerous because it allows the government to single out groups that are less politically powerful or that have less popular views and I have already used this principle from Masterpiece Cake Shop in another case I'm working on defending a group of Native Americans in a situation where the federal government had a highway construction project and the federal government said we can we can adjust our construction project so that we'll protect some nearby wetlands and we'll even protect a private par uh, tattoo parlor but for a sacred historical Native American burial ground with a prehistoric stone altar we just think that's a pile of rocks and we're going to bulldoze right through it and so we are arguing to the government masterpiece says and this is also a long-standing principle if you can offer protection and you do to some groups you can't decide to take away that protection simply because it's a religious belief that you don't understand or don't care about. That principle is also applicable in neighborhoods where uh, the city council might want to allow the building of Judeo or Christian churches but doesn't want a mosque. That principle is relevant in the military where the government has allowed service members to wear beards for a number of secular reasons but until recently, and until some of uh, Beckett's litigation in this area said they, di they didn't want to allow beards for Sikhs in the military for religious reasons. And uh, so I think legally this is a valuable principle that defends everybody, but as conservatives, I think it's important for us to embody this idea that religious liberty is not something that is just for me, but not for thee. Because if that's the only way that we defend religious liberty, then it is subject to whatever administration is in power, whatever views are most popular. And I think this principle was really embodied uh, in, in a lot of the debates surrounding the Masterpiece Cake Shop by some gay business owners that stood up in defense of some of these religious business owners and said, look, we deeply disagree with the views of these religious owners, but we remember what it was like to be marginalized by the government. And we don't want a government that could punish us for our beliefs, and we, so we don't think that we should give the government power to punish these people for their beliefs, even though we disagree, and I really admired that. One other principle that I think is worth talking about from Masterpiece is just the question of why was, why was this case so polarizing? It, it really seemed like it was threatening to pull at the fabric of our nation, and, and how can we avoid that moving forward? And it's interesting that it's such a polarizing case when it, at bottom we're dealing with a debate about cake, and I would submit probably not very good cake. I don't know about you guys, but when I go to weddings, I don't usually think, man, this is delicious, and I just want to eat more. And if I raise a hand, has anyone else had that experience? <laughs> and if you don't want to raise your hand because you're sitting next to someone you just went to their wedding recently, <laughs> I understand. But uh, so why? what was really going on? Why was this so polarizing uh, and, and difficult? And I think I, I would submit to you that one way to answer this question is to think of Masterpiece is a matched pair with Obergefell and, and the way that Justice Kennedy was trying to talk about this issue in these two cases. And if we go back to Obergefell, what Justice Kennedy was saying was the problem in Obergefell, it was not that people disagreed about this issue. In fact, Justice Kennedy said, people of good faith will have different opinions about these issues and they should be allowed to have those opinions and live out those opinions and to, to teach those opinions. That's not the problem. The problem is when government tries to pick one correct view on deeply sensitive moral issues and then punish those who disagree. And that's the same problem in a different context that was going on in Masterpiece. The government in Colorado was trying to say, this is the correct view, this is uh, what we think is appropriate, and we're going to ostracize or punish those who disagree. This is not an issue that is unique to religious liberty and LGBT rights conflicts, and this is not an issue that's even recent. Uh, one case I'll just touch on very briefly and then I'll end that also raised this issue, one, another set of twin cases were the Pledge of Allegiance uh, flag salute cases, Gobitis and Barnett. When we were a country on the brink of entering World War II, uh, some schools began to make it mandatory for children to salute the flag. And in case you don't know, our flag salute uh, looked pretty different back then than it looks now. Children in a classroom would do this to the flag while they said the Pledge of Allegiance. And some people took issue with this for conscience reasons, in particular some Jehovah Witnesses, and said, we, look, we just can't participate in that. And there was a young boy, 11 years old, I believe, named William Gobitis, who decided after listening to some of his religious leaders, he, he wasn't going to salute the flag anymore. And in his classroom, when he kept his hand down, his teacher actually tried to pull his hand up, and he successfully resisted, 
and he was expelled. His family's business was subjected to a boycott, threats of mob violence, and this eventually went up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, well, we have a really important interest as a nation in uh, enforcing patriotism and being proud of our country and having uniformity on these views. So what the school did was okay. Schools can continue to force children to salute the flag in that way. And some historians say that after that decision, it was essentially uh, like the Supreme Court announced open season on Jehovah Witnesses. There was widespread mob violence, burning churches to the ground, some instances of, of, of death. And just a few years later, the Supreme Court took another identical case and said, we got it wrong. We don't have an interest in forcing uniformity on even an important issue like this because that only results in uniformity of the grave. And we are a nation where we believe that government's job isn't to pick one right answer on deeply sensitive issues, that we can disagree and live side by side, and that the guiding star of what we believe in for the First Amendment is that government doesn't get to tell people what the right answer are, and we could live side by side and uh, protect the ability to disagree respectfully. And I think that that is an important principle that should continue to, dis to guide our discussions today as well. Bruce? You're one of the leading constitutional thinkers in the United States. I'd love to get your take on this. I wish you'd tell everyone else that. Just <laughs> <laughs> make them believe you. Uh, let me just start by saying you know, how much I appreciate wh what you said and the work that you do, and um, also just how bad I think things really are that you're needing to do it, uh, by which I mean the following. The idea that we're fighting over whether you can force someone to engage in expressive conduct that violates their deepest religious beliefs is shocking. And I think the real question that we need to ask is, how did we get here? And um, Rich asked us to say something about how, how we approach this. And I, I, I have to say, there, some of this has to do with my own current locality. Um, I grew up mostly in, in Northern California, but for the last 10 years, I've been living in not just flyover country, but burnt out country, <laughs> the kind of places that we've heard, heard about a lot yesterday. The town that I live in, um, 20 years ago, it had 33,000 people in it and a couple of factories. It now has 17,000 people in it, and it has plenty of crack houses and uh, um, meth labs. And the one thing that has been left standing has been um, the Catholic Church. Uh, that's where the school is. Unfortunately, the priest just shut down the high school um, because he feel, felt that there wasn't enough support for it. But what I see in the part of America that I'm currently living in is a community that has been crushed. And what it's been crushed by is, in significant m measure, the idea that America must be this shining sea of diversity within each community where we all can stand next to each other and hug, no matter what. And that's not where religious liberty came from. That's not what religious liberty is. I'm sorry, but um, with respect, I do not believe <coughs> the historical record bears out the idea to begin with that the Puritans came to these shores in order to escape tyranny. The Puritans came to these shores to set up a community in which they could walk in the ways of their Lord as a community, and those who didn't want to could hit the road, or they could get hurt. When the Anglican Church decided that it was time to stomp out dissenting Calvinists in England, the response of the dissenting communities was to form their own dissenting communities. Through covenants, you want to see a covenant? It's called, we've got one, it's called the Mayflower Compact, our most important foundational document. It begins with, in the name of God, amen. And then forms a community where the members agree that they will abide by the rules that they um, come up with on their own as a self-governing community in order to live out their religion. Okay, and I remind you that religion comes from a root that means to bind. It's not spirituality. It's religion. And what we had in this, uh, the colonies that became the United States, and in the United States, up until quite recently, it wasn't until the Franklin Roosevelt administration that you had the courts beginning to decide that it was their job to tell people what they could do in their communities in regard to religion, both pre-exercise and anti-establishmentarianism. The, as I like to call them, the interior decorating cases, where communities were told how many menorahs and how many Santa Clauses 
it takes to cancel out the religious meaning of a crash. Those are all quite recent, and they're all based on judicial fiat. It's made up. What they have done in making this up, though, is destroy the very basis of community and of ordered liberty as understood in America. Um, I've heard it said by a friend of mine that America was a series of intolerant islands within a sea of toleration. That doesn't sound terribly attractive, I know. But what we had was a sea of toleration, which is to say, if you didn't like it as, you know, I'm Catholic, if you were a priest and tried to show up in one of the Calvinist colonies, the first time they'd uh, whip you upside the head until you get out of town. The second time they'd hurt you pretty badly and kick you out of town. The third time they'd hang you. So what's the uh, logical answer? Don't go to that town. This sounds terrible. And most people are revolted by the very idea because it's not nice. The community isn't always nice. However, Americans worked this out in very decent ways for several centuries. Let me tell you one of the ways where I'm at. It's a, it's a training culture still where I live. When you had the wave of German immigrants come, and it had been much the same with other previous waves of immigrants, the immigrants would get their few belongings. They'd be on the train, and the train conductor would say, and there's many records of this, the train conductor would say, okay, Catholics off this stop, Lutherans wait till the next one. And if you go through the communities in this part of the country, you have your German Catholic communities, you have your German um, Lutheran communities. When they grew, they sort of grew together. So you have communities like the one I live in now, where you have the Catholic church here and the Lutheran church is on the other side of town, what used to be essentially separate towns before they had cars. People were capable of both binding themselves together, living in real communities, and not killing yourself. How did they do that? You didn't have a centralized government in Washington, D.C. telling everyone how they had to live their lives. You did have certain rights that were guaranteed to everyone. You had access to courts if someone tried to beat you up or steal from you. You had the right to exit if things got too uh, uncomfortable. And you had limited government. You had the right to enter into natural associations with the people around you in order to lead full, complete lives. Instead of it being, again, the state that would take care of your needs, you would take care of your needs, and that included your health care, that included your burial, uh, that included taking care of the poor, which were rooted in natural association. And what you find is that when people are allowed to form their own associations, they're much more capable of tolerating others. Did this happen all the time? Of course not. But then again, never has never will. But what made America work, and what I submit to you is the great American project, is to have a national government which understands the very limited nature of its powers and the necessity that it actually exercise those powers so that we have things like access to courts, equal protection, uh, and due process, so that we may, in our own organic communities, walk in the ways of our Lord. Yes. Sherry, I'd like you to go next. Sherry is, in my opinion, one of the most masterful conveyors of conversations in the country of Trinity Forum. I've had the honor of attending her events in Washington, D.C., often done in conjunction with Pepperdine, actually, and she's a master of allowing all voices at the table to participate. So we're so lucky to have your perspective here. Well, that's a very gracious introduction. Thank you very much, Rich, and a real pleasure to be here. Uh, my background in a previous life was actually in conservative policy, working for Empower America, which is Jack Kemp's open and Jim Kirkpatrick's organization when it first started, uh, working for Senator Sam Brownback, who was policy director, Bill Frist when he was Senate Majority Leader, uh, First Lady Laura Bush. But as Rich says, for the last 10 years, I've been at the Trinity Forum, uh, which is a faith-based nonprofit that seeks to provide a space and resources for leaders to engage the big questions of life in the context of faith. Uh, certainly the question we're tackling now is one of those, uh, and it's been a real pleasure and an honor to be able to partner with Pepperdine and with Pete Peterson and the School of Public Policy at Pepperdine uh, to do that. We've uh, been hosting together a series of what we call evening conversations in Washington, D.C., uh, that try, again, to bring people to the table to talk about faith in the public square, uh, what does it mean uh, to live your faith out fully there? How should people
people of faith be thinking about some of the big issues that confront us. So I am not a legal scholar or a constitutional scholar. Uh, please direct all your questions about those cases there or there. But um, do just have a couple of quick kind of uh, 30,000 foot thoughts uh, on the topic. One of which is just how far we've come in how short a period of time. Uh, I know this is a, a well-informed audience. Uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RIFRA, uh, which was passed in 1993. The House sponsor was then Congressman Chuck Schumer. Uh, the Senate sponsor was Ted Kennedy. It passed by 97 to 3 in the Senate, with one of the dissenting voices being Jesse Helms. A couple of years earlier, in 1988, uh, 30 years ago this very week, uh, the founders of the Trinity Forum, uh, Oz Guinness and a guy named Al McDonald, among many others, released a statement they called the Williamsburg Charter. If anyone would like a copy of this, just let me know. I'd be delighted to send it to you, which articulated the principles of religious freedom. Uh, this document, which was quite robust, was actually signed by everyone from uh, former President Gerald Ford to former President uh, Jimmy Carter, Earl Warren to uh, Justice Rehnquist, Chuck Colson to Norman Lear. Uh, there actually was at that point a very broad consensus uh, in the country among people of very different philosophical, faith-based, and ideological positions about the importance and the primacy of religious freedom, as well as a bias towards what RIFRA said, which was basically that the government should not intervene if there is a compelling state interest to intervene. It should impose the least possible burden uh, upon uh, the person practicing their faith. So we have come a long way uh, since 1988 or 1993. Uh, how did we get there? Well, there's lots of things that uh, obviously uh, play into that. But one of the reasons, and perhaps an unusual reason that I will offer for consideration that may have contributed to the quickness of the decline is that in part, it, and frequently, religious freedom concerns are now increasingly seen as an identity politics play or a code for discrimination. And one of the main reasons for that is the way that our own identities as citizens have changed. Uh, one illustration of that, in turn, is a study by the Pew Foundation, which is a little bit different, but I think sheds very interesting light on what's happening in the country. Many of us know about the fact that the practice of religion, uh, the fervency with which we practice our faith, seems to be in, the, in decline. The rise of the nuns, uh, not N-U-N, but N-O-N-E-S, uh, is radically increasing. And at the same time, we are more likely to think of ourselves as political animals first. This Pew study, which was actually on marriage in America, found something very interesting, which was in 2010, eight years ago, almost 40% of people getting married were getting married to someone outside their faith. At the same time, among both Republicans and Democrats, 76% and 77% uh, respectively were marrying someone of the same party. This is actually a radical reversal of what has happened um, in previous decades in our history. Usually, one's faith was considered primary in terms of finding a suitable mate, in terms of being something one holds together um, and a shared sense of identity, mission, and purpose. That has, in many ways, been replaced by politics being more central and deeper to one's identity, reflected in the way one chooses a mate. Now, obviously, that plays out in all sorts of ways as well. But as our identities have become increasingly political, it shouldn't surprise us too much that we're weaponizing politics as a means of addressing those differences. And so at the same time that our identities are getting more political, our politics are getting increasingly apocalyptic. Now, there's, I can't imagine any better example of that than our last election and the rhetoric that surrounded uh, that election. Uh, and that was really on both left and right. Uh, the Flight 93 election, uh, you see it in so many of the, the comments that were made on the left as well, uh, where there's a growing sense that this is it. This is the big ball game. If we don't win, somehow our side is threatened, uh, is in danger, and increasingly we see the other side with fear and contempt. In the past, because 
often religious and faith-based affiliations were primary, it was quite possible to be with people, to commune with people, where you held the deepest faith convictions in common while having different political views. And that tends to sort of uh, make some of those political views seemingly more easy to discuss and perhaps to handle. So where do we go from here? Sadly, I do not have the magic bullet. Uh, I think this is going to be a very difficult situation for our country. Uh, there will have to be the cases th that have been worked on. Uh, but there are two things, I think, that are necessary, if insufficient, in dealing with this. And one uh, is, of course, a sense of civic education. I think Senator Benny has called this the need for a civic catechesis. Uh, it is not part of human nature to deeply value that which we do not know. And so there is a growing sense of ignorance about both the history, the nature, the importance, and the incredible worth of the religious freedom that was so obtained with such difficulty over so many years uh, and a devaluing of how precious it is and how much it needs to be protected. I think there's also an increasing need for simple civility to approach these issues with some humility and some courtesy rather than with activism. Many of these issues could have been very easily dealt with by simple courtesy uh, rather than immediately turning to the courts and, um, and taking it almost as a matter of personal principle. There's been an increasing sense to kind of use the personal insult and turn it into a political weapon. Part of this is often even divorced from the principle of the thing itself. Again, it often seems to be human nature to react more angrily when our pride is pricked, uh, than even when our ideals are assaulted. And I think an increased uh, sense of accommodation, of civility, is going to be a necessary, if entirely insufficient, condition to finding a way forward. Along those lines, I should caveat that with the fact that that does not mean squishiness at all. And I think one of the greatest counterexamples to that is Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham Jail, uh, which was both courteous and very frank, was meant to persuade, but also indicted. But in reaching out to the white clergy of Birmingham, Alabama, he made a very forceful case and it was a very pointed criticism. But in doing so, he invoked their shared faith, invoking Bunyan, Niebuhr, Augustine, Aquinas, and the like in making his case. He adopted you know, a, a vocabulary and a language that could be heard and that they would need to reflect on. And so I think it's a great example of a posture we may consider taking in the future as we uh, increasingly have some of these challenges. To be civil, to be informed, to make a very pointed case in language that can be understood with examples that need to be reckoned with uh, and a spirit that invites a conversation. To Hal Khan, I was hoping you could give us a little bit of a global perspective with your work internationally. Could you tell us a little bit about what you're doing outside of your work with Microsoft? Sure. Well, thanks, Rich, and uh, thanks to Pete and to all of you uh, for allowing me the opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you. This has been fascinating just to, to listen to, and I'm uh, honored that uh, I have an opportunity to share some of my thoughts. Um, just by way of background, uh, I'm a native Californian, uh, so it's good to be back home, uh, even just for a few days. Um, but my parents were immigrants from South India in the 60s. My dad came out to Wyoming, of all places, in 1966 and my mother to Colorado in 68. They came here seeking, uh, like many, uh, economic and educational opportunities, but, but particularly religious opportunities, religious freedom. My dad came from a very poor family in South India, and um, unlike the kind of cliche, if you guys watch uh, ESPN spelling bee competitions, his parents did not want him to go to school, wanted him to work, and um, he had the audacity to want to uh, finish high school and then to go to college. And he got a scholarship, the only one at the time, uh, for all of India to go study at the University of Moscow. And his parents, who were very much against um, the idea of getting a higher education, uh, really put their foot down and said, you're not going to go to a communist country, a place where they don't respect uh, uh, religion. But he pers uh, persevered. In the following year, he got a scholarship to uh, the University of Wyoming in that metropolis of Laramie. And uh, his father 
we said, look, even though I'm against this whole idea and against you going far away from our family and not working to support the family, I do know that America is a country that respects uh, faith, respects uh, God, and therefore I, I give you my blessing to go uh, and travel and, and study. And that is kind of our personal story. And so when I, I'm the oldest of five children, uh, born in Colorado, but primarily grew up right here in California, uh, that was something that was very deeply ingrained in me uh, that uh, we are an exceptional country. And we are an exceptional country because of uh, many uh, rights enshrined in our Constitution, including uh, the right enshrined in our First Amendment, the right to religious liberty. And that that right is something that is very specific to the individual and that it is not only a right for one to have freedom of conscience, the freedom to practice one's religion. And as many um, will often, uh, particularly from the secular left, will articulate that, that there is meant to be something only in a personal zone and that um, that is not something that may spill into the public. Uh, my feeling as also as a lawyer is that, that the Constitution is very clear and that the reason for the, the enshrinement of the First Amendment, including both religious liberty and the right to free speech, is that that right of religious expression does extend to the public arena. That individuals do have the right to express themselves, including their own faithful, their, their beliefs based in their faith in the public arena, in the public um, sphere. And so that does allow for, for example, valedictorians to mention their faith in their speeches or for uh, sessions to be open with prayer. Um, but there are obviously limitations in that there is not to be an established religion in the country. And obviously, while we, l we strive to continue to live to, the up to these principles as enshrined in our Constitution, there's no doubt that in practice we've had uh, instances of challenges and many faith groups and individuals adhering to various religions have no doubt faced uh, opposition, uh, including from government. And you need only look at the, the history of uh, the Jewish uh, experience in our country, Catholics, uh, now uh, people from my own faith, the Muslim tradition, are facing challenges, and many from other tra traditions, Sikh, Hindu, and Jehovah Witnesses, as I've already been articulated, continue to have uh, Mormons have had different times uh, uh, challenges. A senator that uh, Sheree and I both served with uh, in Congress, uh, Kit Bond, used to always remind me that when he was governor of Missouri, he repealed a shoot on sight law for Mormons in Missouri in the early 80s. Uh, I'm talking about the 1980s. Um, <laughs> and so <laughs> while we have these amazing uh, principles enshrined in our Constitution, we often, as humans, with failings as humans, fall short of what our founding fathers enshrined in such a great document. The other, uh, as I, the other thing, as I, as I mentioned in, re in reminding our fellow Americans that there is no established religion, it's often very interesting to look back at uh, what was debated when that issue was being considered. I remember just uh, the last election cycle and the, and the cycle before that, there was this great discussion on whether First, when Mitt Romney was asked in 2012, would he appoint a Muslim American to his cabinet? He said, no, I wouldn't. Um, and I don't remember why he said that, but it was, it was something a little awkward. Um, and then likewise, Herman Cain, when he was running, said, you know, I don't consider Islam a religion and I wouldn't vote for a, a Muslim president, even though there wasn't anybody from the Muslim faith running for president. So it always seems odd when our politics get, you know, kind of distracted by non, uh, you know, non, issues that are not really, you know, that we're not facing. But, you know, I, I looked back at the debates, and even back in that time when we were debating the Constitution and the various provisions there within, there was discussion about these very issues. And even though there were not Muslims that were participating in the public arena, or for that many, many from the Jewish or other faiths, they had these discussions. And those who were pro proposing that we do have an established religion, uh, we're saying, look, if you don't have an established religion, then it's conceivable that people of the Jewish faith, Papists, what they called Catholics at the time, or Mohammedans or Turks, they use the term interchangeably to describe Muslims, could conceivably not only seek, but even secure elected office. 
but the majority of the framers, and, w and when argued, and when they finally voted, this vote came out to be the case, they said, look, that is what religious liberty is all about. Indeed, the, the governor of North Carolina at the time had a great uh, response to those uh, hypothetical uh, you know, concerns about Jews, Papists, and, and Mohammedans seeking elected office. He said, look, if that would have happened, one of two things would have happened. One, the majority of the country was one of those religions, or that person of, of the, that particular faith was deemed to be the, the, uh, the, the best person for the job. And either way, that is democracy uh, at, uh, functioning as it should. And so uh, ultimately, they decided not to have an established religion. And that's something that's very important, I believe, um, in the issues that we now are facing uh, in the public discourse. Rich asked about some of my work internationally. Uh, I worked in politics and government uh, for several years. I worked for a congressman from California on Capitol Hill for five. Then I served uh, along with Cherie in the George W. Bush administration. Al although I should point to Rich, my first campaign was the Bush 1988 campaign right here in California. Um, and then in the Bush administration, um, I increasingly was, was called upon, I worked in the public liaison office doing engagement with various uh, communities around the country, particularly the faith communities. And so I assisted in these uh, the outreach to the uh, evangelical and Catholic communities. Um, you know, I, I joke that being um, a good Muslim, of, of good Muslim parents, we all went to Catholic schools. <laughs> and so I felt very comfortable uh, continuing to do outreach to the Catholic community. Uh, people forget, but George W. was not um, necessarily trusted by evangelical Christians uh, in the 2000 cycle, and so there was a very concerted effort by the White House to really uh, go out there and, and to reach out to various communities of faith, including the evangelical uh, Christian community. Uh, being Muslim, I was engaged with the Muslim American community. It seems like a quaint time, but over 78% of Muslim Americans voted for George W. Bush in the 2000 elections, uh, over 60,000 in Florida alone. And if you guys remember uh, what happened in Florida, winning by 521 votes, 60,000 votes from one particular uh, faith group was very much appreciated by uh, the president and, uh, and his administration. Um, and then I worked uh, in doing outreach to various other communities of faith that were still relatively new to the political arena, including the Hindu, Sikh, and Buddhist communities. Uh, I'm proud to say that, as again, as a proud Muslim, I began the uh, uh, Diwali uh, festival uh, uh, event at the White House, which I hope will continue. Um, but I found that, of course, post 9-11, uh, you know, the two things that we're taught as Americans not to discuss in, po in polite company, politics and faith, that our national security was at the intersection of the two. And so it was increasingly important for me, particularly as a Muslim American, to begin engaging on issues of religious freedom, not only in the United States, uh, as, as we continue to do, but also around the globe, uh, as Rich pointed out, in places like Egypt, the Middle East, Asia, and other places where religious freedom uh, is not necessarily well respected, and it's not something that can be taken for granted. And so when I left the Bush administration, I joined uh, a think tank called the Institute for Global Engagement, which is an evangelical Christian think tank uh, dedicated to promoting religious freedom uh, around the globe, and began working in places like China, uh, Vietnam, and Nigeria, and Syria before the Civil War, uh, and other places to really push for religious freedom, whether those countries were communist, whether they were majority Muslim, whether they were majority Christian, uh, uh, or other faiths, and to really bring to bear uh, the example of the American experience, good and bad, as Cherie mentioned, not to come with a sense of, of entitlement or we're Americans and we he we're here to tell you what to do, but to come to other countries, other uh, communities, first to stand up for the other, whomever that might be, uh, regardless of the faith tradition, but also particularly when engaging in a very transparent manner with government officials, including places like Syria or in China or Vietnam where there is there, there uh, was ho outright hostility towards religious practice, to try to bring examples of how we as Americans have grappled those issues and continue to strive for that balance as rich articulated in his introduction, but also 
also to really kind of put forward some of the negative experiences we've had and how we've gotten through that. How we got through the discrimination against Catholics, for example. How we got through the discrimination against other faith communities in this country. Always looking and hoping that we would come back to the principles as enshrined in our U.S. Constitution. I'll end by saying that I think we are always as people searching uh, for the answers and whether those questions might be something that might be directed towards us or our particular identity group or our neighbors or others around the globe, we're often uh, struggling uh, for an answer. In my faith tradition, uh, we read in our scriptures that God created us from one man and one woman, Adam and Eve, and from those people he created many nations and tribes, not so that we would engage in conflict but so that we would know each other with affection and grow together as one humanity. That is what's in God's design for all of us. Uh, he could have made us all one faith. He could have made us all one ethnic uh, background, one race, uh, of one uh, uh, language. But he chose in his own infinite wisdom not to do so, but so that we would appreciate and love one another. But of course, the human condition is one where that is not necessarily what we often uh, engage in uh, because we are human and we have our own failings and so oftentimes we uh, will try to emphasize a difference or to pull back to our own identity groups, our own tribe uh, in a hostile uh, manner rather than one that's the one based on, on mutual understanding. And so that's why for me the Constitution is very much not only a document of rights, of principles for our government, but in a way a prayer a fervent prayer that we adhere to those principles, that we continue to strive and look for guidance from that document uh, as we grapple with issues not only here uh, in our local communities, but indeed around the globe. So I look forward to the conversation and to your questions and answers, or my answers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And now we're going to hear from Monica Mehta. You may recognize as a pretty much of a regular in Bill Maher's program, and she's uh, an author in the area of entrepreneurship and is writing a book now on women and spirituality in that role. So from that perspective, and I did tell her she'd be representing all Hindus. On the <laughs> uh, could you give us your perspective, Monica? Hindus in the house. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a financial expert. Um, I Usually when there's a jobs report or if there's um, economic data that comes out, I'm on CNN, Fox, um, uh, MSNBC, CNBC, just talking about how these economic data points impact our lives and increasingly that has been drawn into a political conversation. Um, for me, uh, I, I've spent the last three years really getting off course. Um, I've been researching the history of women and what are all of the different roles that women have played in society um, from the very beginning. So this is prehistory to present day. Um, I'm looking across the world, I'm looking at a lot of different cultures and religion is, is actually just a little part of it. Um, the idea is just um, to try to understand, you know, has there been any one, one role that women have always played throughout society? And this curiosity um, hit me because of, of a personal experience that I had. And, and to understand why is a financial expert looking into things like this, you have to understand my backstory. Um, so I grew up on a merchant marine ship. Mm -hmm. My father was a merchant marine ship's captain, and um, I had a bike on the boat and a swing on the boat. And um, when we were five, um, it was time to get an education, and I couldn't get a proper education on the boat. So my family immigrated here to Texas, and um, they put a third of their life savings and started a business. And I was a latchkey kid. I was pretty much left on my own, and every weekend I would work in my parents' stores. I mean, by the age of 10, I was clocking $10,000 in sales, because can you turn down a little kid who knows how to sell? Um, so, you know, everyone was expected to pitch in, and um, I have a brother. We were very close growing up. I was a very good student. Uh, I was intent on going to the Ivy League, and I did. And um, when I was in school, my brother met a very wealthy woman uh, from a Middle Eastern family, and within a year of marrying the woman, um, he tried to force my parents into retirement. So my family business had grown substantially at that point. And um, so when my parents would not turn over the business to him, he tried to put them out of business. So while I graduated from Wharton, it was fully expected that I join the family business and pitch
pitch in. And that's what I did. Um, I worked for several years in private equity. I worked for several years in strategy consulting. And so for the next 18 years, I helped take an apparel company and turn it into um, a real estate investment company and grew the size of the fund considerably. The, the story takes a twist um, about three years ago when um, my grandmother passed away. So my grandmother lived with us. She was um, the mother of eight girls, one of 10 sisters. And um, at her uh, funeral, this is when my brother returned after almost two decades to, to, to perform the last rites for a woman that he had not seen in 20 years. And what I was told is a woman is not strong enough to take the soul to the next life. And I think that made a chip in my brain snap. <laughs> so, um, you know, I just I started thinking about it. I'm, I'm not a religious scholar of any kind, but, you know, everything I know about Hinduism is that, unlike a lot of other religions, divinity is gender free. Um, it's neither masculine nor feminine. In fact, when we're praying for strength, we, we pray to a female goddess. And when we're praying for wealth for our family, we pray to a female goddess for knowledge. Again, female. But how are women not strong enough? And so um, I, I started just spending late nights researching, and one thing led to another. And, and having a fairly diverse career in media and in investments, I, I have a pretty big network. And so one of the doors that opened to me was National Geographic. And I started working with National Geographic um, and their scientists to understand um, you know, what are the roles? What was it like for cave women? Did they have it all? Um, and just looking at all of these different cultures to understand um, what is the, the role of women throughout the ages. And it's very interesting because um, India is an exceptional case study in terms of the status of women and how that cycles up and down. Today, the G20 lists India as the worst place to be a woman in the developed world. Um, and that's based on a couple of different factors. One is that 63 million girls are missing from society um, because abortion is legal. And who do they abort? They abort the female fetuses. It's 98% of abortion in India is a female fetus. Um, the gender imbalance has hit the point of eight, 814 girls for um, every 1,000 boys in Mumbai. And again, this is not the uneducated. It's actually uh, wealthier, upper middle class people that can even afford abortion procedures. Um, in India, 66% of the women uh, report facing abuse and harassment. Um, widows are considered culturally unlucky. And um, if you go outside of Delhi, about 100 miles outside of New Delhi, there are cities where there are more than 40,000 elderly women who are widows that are, that are living homeless or in ashrams, and they're deposited there by their own families. Um, if, you, if you're a woman in India, you can get an education. If you're you know, in the upper classes, you can have a career outside of the home. But should things not work out in your family, this is what you face. 85% of domestic violence in India happens in front of extended family members who allow the violence to persist. Um, 57, this is, a, this is statistics from the government of India. 57% of adolescent boys believe it's OK for a husband to beat his wife. 53% of adolescent girls believe it's OK for a husband to beat his wife. Um, if a woman leaves and attempts to get a divorce, even wealthy women can end up in destitution. The courts award between 2 and 10% of um, a husband's salary as maintenance payments. And this is in a country where only 3% of wages are actually even reported. So this creates huge financial constraints. And so this, again, this dichotomy of what is happening to women in India and how, how is it that we pray to these goddesses for strength and wisdom and uh, prosperity and this is the actual state of women today. And so um, there's, there's a really interesting data point for the cyclicality and the role of women and the role of religion and the role of culture and how these things are completely intermixed. So um, what I learned as I dug into India is that the Indus Valley is probably um, the most significant period of India's history. This is 3500 BC to 1800 BC. This is one of the four great ancient civilizations in the Bronze Age. Um, the Harappan people, so this extends from what is modern Afghanistan down to um, Sri Lanka today. In, in the Harappan civilization, it was a fairly wealthy culture. Um, what burial analysis tells us is that women were actually buried with uh, 
um, their families, and it was a matrilineal culture, so not matriarchy, women were not in charge, but it was actually that men left their families to join the women's family. Um, this was a trading hub that traded with um, most, most other um, Bronze Age civil civilizations, and what we can see from art is relics of um, reference to Shiva, which is one of the ancient gods, and reference to Durga. So if you ever see a goddess who's sitting on a lion with all the different hands and the weapons, this is actually the reverence back to this point. Um, this was a fairly sophisticated society. They had indoor plumbing. <laughs> That's not something we had in the Middle Ages. Um, so like many of the ancient civilizations, it was actually, um, you know, it led to its own extinction. There was no signs of war for 2,000 years in this area. And it was actually climate change. It was um, a change in the monsoon cycle that led to a drought for more than 200 years that caused mass famine in the region. And as people spread and moved to other parts of the world, um, you actually saw a lot of changes in this region. So you had the Indo-Aryans um, enter in the region around 1800 BC. And this is the Vedic period. This is the time um, where you can trace back the oldest written doctr doctrines of Hinduism um, to this period. And in the oldest written documents of Hin Hinduism, um, women were among the authors of the religion. So more than two dozen of the rishis who authored the Vedas were women. Um, it was encouraged for daughters to learn the Vedas and be the spiritual guides for their families. What you saw is in North India, 3,000 years of invasion in the region. So you had um, Greeks, Arabs, Turks, Mamluks, Khalij, Tulaks, Lodis, Mughals, and then the British in the 1800s. And with every group that came in, what you found was that women saw their status in society decline. And um, when you know, one of the one of the issues that pops up when we talk about religion and you know what are our beliefs and what do we follow? Well, which scripture do we follow? So in India, you've got the Vedas, and the Vedas was first carried down in oral tradition. Again, thousands of years old. First written doc document is in the Vedic age. But now you have the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, which are authored between 900 and 400 BCE. This is during um, more than a millennia of war. And what you see in these, in these doctrines is actually stories of war, an allegory where lessons of life are taught through war. But the byproduct there is also um, what, is the, what is the status of women and how are they treated in these stories and how does that differ from the older um, more um, authoritarian texts of Hinduism. So by two to 300 BCE, the Manu Smirti, which is the first written laws of India, actually had um, women's status greatly diminished, whereas you had um, millennia of inheritance actually traced through the woman's side of the family. Um, they, they actually were not, in, they were not enabled to inherit anything. Their status in society was completely locked as consort of their husband. And when you look at the status of widows today, it traces back to this. There was a point in time as we transitioned um, that a woman's independent role became linked to her husband, and when the husband passed away, she, she was considered of no value. And so now you have this belief system in society that just allows families to deposit mothers, I mean someone's mother, just out on the street. And Monica, I think we're going to have to stop there if we're going to have time for questions. So thank you so much for that. That's fantastic. So I, I want to go right to questions, actually, uh, in the interest of time. Yeah. So I just want to go right to questions rather than the, I was going to have the panel talk amongst themselves. But I'd rather just, if there are questions out there from the audience on the topic of religious liberty, uh, what are the, what, what, uh, any hands, any questions on the topic that you've heard today? Yes, sir. Amendment, the 
because I think there are lots of questions. And are we also dealing with simply religious communities or are, have we gotten away from a God-centered community? We often are very religious, but we seem to forget about God within those religions. So it's, it's a comment that I hope you'll turn into an interrogatory or comment on. Anybody want to take that on? sort of religions are getting protection and is it absolute. I agree with you that this is not a protection that is or should be absolute just as freedom of speech is not something that is or should be absolute. Uh, I think Rich worded it really well we were discussing last night and his, his description was in layman's terms, we protect religious liberty as much as we can but we draw the line when government has certain strong interests and, and the way that the test works under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and uh, also to some extent under the Constitution is you look at, is there a sincere religious belief? And believe it or not, a fair amount of cases sometimes get bumped out under this prong. We don't look at, are their religious beliefs correct or orthodox or do I agree with them? We just say, is, is this a religious belief that's sincere? And there have been cases, for example, where drug traffickers said that they were starting the church of marijuana worship and you know, may not shock you to believe that courts made quick work of that and said that's a sham, that's not a religious belief, nice try. Uh, there was a prisoner who said that he worshiped the spaghetti monster and wanted a special dietary accommodation and that didn't get protection either. Uh, so then if you pass that threshold, you show my religious belief is sincere and the government is doing something to either coerce me uh, and or pressure me to not be able to perform my religious belief or to do something that is contrary to my religious belief, then it's the government's turn and the government gets to say, well, we have a really strong interest in doing this thing and we can't accomplish it in an easier way. But it's tough for the government to make that argument if the government is making lots of other exceptions. So one example that was a recent unanimous Supreme Court case that Beckett litigated we were defending a Muslim prisoner who wanted to be able to have a beard in, in prison consistent with his religious beliefs. And the, the prison said, well, well, that's really concerning because like, there's security in interests, you could hide weapons or razor blades in your beard. Uh, and I was at oral argument that day when the justices were asking questions and they said, but you let people wear beards for other reasons. You let prisoners wear beards for medical reasons. So if beards were so dangerous, if you really had such a strong interest then you wouldn't be granting exceptions. And, and by the way, we think that there's other ways that you can, just, uh, Justice Alito said, if you really wanted to get all the small revolvers or out of his beard, just have him shake his beard and the, and the, the gun will fall out. He was obviously being <laughs> a little bit pejorative there. But, uh, that, so, but if the government is really enforcing their interest in an even-handed way, and if they're really trying to protect harm against individuals or things like that, then absolutely, religious liberty will hit uh, a limit. And I think it's important for our society to have those sorts of reasonable limits. Um, yeah, thanks. Obviously, that, that, that's right. She, we, we know the law here. The question, though, that I think that comes out here is, is whether this actually works in any meaningful sense. And, um, when you, you bring up the idea of, of double standards, but there, there's another aspect of this, which is what is a compelling state interest? And there are all kinds of legal terms that we use, we throw out there, which really are just covering up cultural assumptions, deeply rooted cultural assumptions. And one of them that we operate under now is that these are all national standards, okay? That we have to have, uh, the government has to be um, pr promoting a specific kind of religious uh, faith and exercise. And um, again, with, with, with respect, um, that's not the way it was written into the Constitution. What we had was federal neutrality. Uh, we had, as a matter of fact, uh, establishments in half a dozen states when uh, the Constitution was passed, and they lasted well into the 19th century. The issue was the federal government not being involved there. And what that means is that you had different answers at different times in different places as to what worked. And it tended to have a lot to do with the makeup of the people. It was democratic in a very basic sense. What were the people in particular states willing to deal with? And yes, to a certain extent, tolerate. And if you want the big example, uh, it's polygamy, right? 
Um, Mormons, uh, LDS folks, have real reason to stand for <laughs> religious liberty, right? Because they were on the business end of a, uh, a view against it. But um, one of the um, determinations that was made was that um, the natural family, the nuclear family, was essential to um, American society and American civilization. And that's a deeply culturally hated decision. Are we willing to say that that is now too historical, it's too specific of a particular religion, now we want to do away with that? What does that bring with it? Well, the fear at the time was that it would bring up the kinds of uh, treatments of women that we just heard being talked about. And it seems that we have to come to some kind of an agreement of what we want religion in our communities to be. And I submit to you that if we want a civil discussion about this, it's much more likely to work out peacefully and well if it's rooted at a much more local level than uh, to try to work it out uh, in the nation.
includes our statistics for India, which actually is a Hindu majority, but there's Muslim as well. Um, one, one point that I didn't make is in North India, which is where you had all this invasion and you saw this progressive decline for women, South India did not have the invasion. And what's interesting is women retained higher levels in society in South India throughout these millennia. So the, the literacy rate in Kerala for women is 93% versus 65% broader for the rest of India. They have um, higher political office, business office, and again, make principal economic decisions for families. Same religion. <laughs>